Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist on this channel. I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in this video, we are talking about Christmas trees and specifically the Christmas tree water. This was a question that was asked by a follower on Instagram and I am here to give you the answer. If you didn't know, I am on Instagram as well. Be sure to follow me there. It does have obviously the same vibe to it, gardening plants, that sort of fun stuff, but there's also lots more footage and photos of all the animals in my life and more of my personal side. So if that's something that you guys are interested in, be sure to hit me up in that place. We also do have discussions about plants and you can always DM me if you have any specific questions that you would like answered. So as always, we're going to put a science spin on this bad boy behind me. We do real trees in this house, mostly because we have cats. Artificial trees have the hinges and cats tend to like to sit on the branches and over time those branch hinges tend to warp and eventually the artificial tree is no longer any good. This video we're going to be going over the environmental impact, how to exactly pick a tree, how much of the end you have to cut off, how much water you should use, what kind of water you should use, additives you should maybe put into your water, and everything else in between. So let's just hop right into it. So with real trees one of the biggest factors about them is that they take five to seven years to grow and they're usually harvested from an actual tree farm so somebody who is planting these trees evergreen for the purpose of making christmas trees one day fun fact you can get abnormal or natural looking trees and they're actually cheaper so this bad boy behind me is considered a natural tree because he's not perfectly asymmetrical meaning he's a lot less expensive but he's also kind of odd looking that is what i prefer but it's not necessarily something you have to go with of course you can go with the perfectly grown ones Something that's really cool and what a lot of provincial and some national parks offer is an actual Christmas tree harvest. So you can go in, you just have to go to the head office and ask for the details, make sure that that park does this, but you can inquire as to how you can cut down your own Christmas tree. There's a lot of different reasons for this, but one of the main reasons is for, for the ecology of the forest. When we cut down trees, we reduce the monoculture, we allow for more sunlight to penetrate all the way through to the forest floor, which actually helps grow a plethora of different species. It actually helps prevent against forest fires and it brings down the competition in the forest in general. So while you may think logging and deforestation is a bad thing, it's actually not always the case. You can talk to anyone who's in the forestry industry and they will tell you how seriously they take this. So that is something that you can try. I know Cypress Hills Provincial Park in Saskatchewan does this and there are tons of other ones you can look into. Another thing I recommend is finding out where the Christmas trees you're purchasing are coming from. So what is the drive time to the area where these are being sold? This one, for example, is only an hour and a half north of where I currently am. In Prince Albert is actually where this guy is harvested from. That is a big deal, not only for freshness, but to ensure that there's not diseases and other things that are coming into your area because trees do carry diseases. You want to limit the travel far and wide of these trees and you want to try to get them locally. So a, I did find a study that was done by a sustainability consulting company. The company's name was Alepsis and I probably messed that up, I hope not, but they did some research on the difference between artificial versus real trees. The fact is that they used to determine whether or not a real or fake tree is more sustainable is things like drive time, human health, resource usage, how the plant is disposed of, and climate its effects on climate change and a whole other plethora of factors. It is the opinion of the researchers of the Alepsis group that real trees are actually the better choice for the environment. So if you are a conscious consumer, then live trees is actually the way to go. The exception to this rule is if you're able to keep an artificial tree for over 20 years. So 
if you're able to keep your artificial tree happy, healthy, and alive looking for over 20 years, then actually the artificial tree is the better choice. In my experience, I can't keep an artificial tree for more than three years, so I always go with the live ones. The reason for this is actually because of the amount of oil and fossil fuel that goes into making artificial trees, as well as the drive time, and then of course, how do you recycle something that's made of metal and plastic? It's honestly impossible, and therefore it is a item that has to go into the dump and it's not able to be recycled afterwards. This is where one of the viewers asked the question. They kept on seeing posts and YouTube videos of people telling them to use things like sugar, molasses, honey, and then I researched and I found a few other crazy myths such as aspirin, vodka, bleach, vinegar, corn syrup, and just a whole host of other things. So we're gonna go into the science of whether or not you should use these and also why these are suggested to be used. Fun fact, my grandma Labrec actually does use bleach with her cut flowers. So that is something that you do use with flowers, but we'll get into exactly why it helps preserve. So the truth about whether we put water or something else into the mix is actually completely based on how we make the xylem of the plant happy. Because the xylem is what transports the water to the rest of the plant, or in this case, the tree, it is, it is important that we keep this system running. The good news is, is that this system is a passive transport system, meaning it's using some form of capillary action or soluble ion content to actually drag the water up the system. That is good because we just killed our tree by cutting it off at the base. But what it means is that we need to work against gravity, meaning the taller the tree is that you decide to choose, the faster it is going to dry out. So if you want those needles to last a extended period of time, you're gonna wanna go with a shorter tree rather than a taller one. Fun fact is that scientists can't actually tell us how xylem works. It's all theories at this point. That's uh, plant blindness for you. If you haven't watched that video, go check it out. So there's three accepted theories. The first one being the pressure flow hypothesis, also known as the cohesion theory. This is considered the most accepted theory across all plant scientist circles. And it essentially suggests that the sugars that are produced by the greenery or the foliage on the plant actually acts as a charge that resides in the phloem. This high concentration concentration of solutes in the phloem next to or at potential interconnecting areas where the xylem and the phloem meet acts as a draw or a straw. This negative pressure ultimately forces the water, which has a lower solute co concentration, to go up the tree, uh, essentially like osmosis. The second theory is transpirational pull. So transpirational pull is essentially that as the tree transpires, which we've talked about evapotranspiration and that whole system before, this is something similar to that. As that expires and the water is leached out, it causes a pressure in the system, which is like a straw and it will pull the water up to the top of the plant. And then the final theory, which doesn't apply here, has to do entirely with the roots. So to allow for better water absorption into our Christmas tree, we need to cut off the bottom once we get it. The typical rule of thumb is one to two inches, but if you want to be on the extra safe side, you're gonna wanna cut until you feel a dampness across the entire diameter of the bottom. There's actually no proof saying that a straight across cut versus an angle cut is better. The one thing I will warn you against is that if you do an angle cut, you're going to wanna make sure that you can still cover the entire circumference of the tree with water, meaning that the diagonal cut has to be able to reach all the way into the water and you want zero portions of that tree to be exposed. 
I want you to think of the xylem organ as basically tiny straws that are going up around the base of the tree and we want all those straws to be able to access water when we need it. If you have a holder that is a flat bottom and has no ridges, and you know that if you make a straight cut across the diameter of the plant and you just plump it down, that you won't kind of be able to block off with the plastic on the bottom, or it'll make kind of like a seal. What you're gonna to wanna to do is actually do that diagonal cut. So, that, so one tip of that trunk is touching and then the rest going upwards is just underneath the water. That is a technique you can use in the event that you think a cut straight across the bottom is not going to work with your system. The number one rule is the entire thing has to be covered and you don't want it sitting on the bottom of the container. One of the weirdest things that I found on the internet when it came to taking care of a Christmas tree was actually ripping off the bark on the bottom of the portion of the tree. Do not do that. That is a very bad idea. You want to keep that xylem intact and the xylem actually is located directly underneath that bark layer. So we wanna do everything in our power to make sure all those tiny little straws are intact and not pinched or scarred or have little holes punctured in them. And that also goes for the actual screws that you screw in with your base. I heavily suggest getting a base that has the screws that are padded or using some sort of padding on the screws to ensure that when you tighten them, you're not drilling into the bark instead of you're just adding a firm pressure. So we've figured out all the water side, we figured out the science about the xylem. Now, what else is gonna help keep the needles on the trees? Well, keeping it near a window is a huge factor and away from heat vents when possible. So if you are able to keep it cold or keep it in a drafty place, this is better than somewhere that is warm. This all goes back to the level of evaporation from the plant. We want to slow down the respiration process. We actually want those stomata to almost go to sleep. The less moisture we're losing through the needles during photosynthesis and respiration, the better and the longer the tree is going to last. Heat is going to make that tree want to take off and try to grow despite not having the rest of the plant to do it. So this is very important. Cold or coolness is always a good idea. The exception to this rule is when you first initially bring the tree into your home and you are getting ready to unthaw it and basically cut off the outer casing that it's in, one thing you can do is actually use slightly lukewarm water, which will just kind of kickstart the system and what you can put in the base. But after that, try to go with room temperature when possible. If the base of the tree ever dries out or you forget about it, which you shouldn't because you should be checking this almost every single day, First day, it will not be abnormal if it drinks an entire container or two. If you ever forget about it and the bottom dries out or the bottom is exposed to air, you will need to actually cut it again because we need to find those that fresh xylem organ, those fresh straws that are still able to take up water and haven't collapsed on themselves due to dehydration. So let's get into the whole what to put into the water and why. There was a study done in 2010 by the University of Wisconsin actually on this specific topic. And it basically showed that water and plain water is the best choice when it comes to the stuff you put into the base of your Christmas tree. So where did this myth come from? Well, I'm assuming it came from the floral industry, which does use the bleach and the sugar or the corn syrup and everything else in between. They actually do use these methods for good reason though. In this case, we have a woody stem or a woody plant. So that's what makes this tree different than a cut flower. Flowers or non-woody plants tend to produce a sticky, 
sap that comes out the bottom of the stem. And if you have a clear vase where you actually keep your flowers, you will have noticed this in any of the cut flowers you've ever brought home. It will get kind of like a jelly, spider web, milky look at the bottom. That's exactly the stuff I'm talking about. So that gummy stuff is actually what blocks the xylem in the plant. If the xylem is blocked, we therefore can't take up water. The good news is Christmas trees don't produce that mucky stuff and therefore they never have their xylem blocked by the gummy substance. However, for the floral industry, using sugars in bleach is actually super beneficial because it starves off that mucky goodness. And so, so long as they can keep the, the muckiness off the edges of the stems, we're able to actually transport water properly to the beautiful flowers above. However, with the trees, as long as our xylem will stay open, so long as we cut it an inch or two above the bottom once we receive it at home, and we do everything in our power to prevent it from drying out, your tree will be fine. The other reason for the sugar thought is because it's the theory probably is that because it's not photosynthesizing, it's not producing carbohydrates, and therefore it's not able to feed its appetite. Again, that's not the case. There are some things you can use. They are called antiperspirants, and it is a spray that you actually put onto your real Christmas trees. The purpose of the spray is actually to prevent respiration um, and therefore conserve water in the system. I don't know if these work. If they do work, they would have to be regularly applied, probably daily, so you would want to follow the instructions. However, that is one theory or one hack that I would probably say would help to keep needles on your tree. I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, be sure to give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and let me know in the comments, do you use artificial or do you use real trees? I would love to know. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye!